The UN aid chief, Martin Griffiths, is right now briefing the UN Security Council via video link. Let's have a listen. But it also now deprives Gaza of a facility that cared for more than 45,000 patients a year before the current hostilities. So I am compelled to reiterate, and this will not surprise anybody, as everyone else has done on many occasions in this council, that under international humanitarian law, there are simple requirements. There are simple rules of war, which are applied to all of us, whatever the provocation, and God knows there has been provocation. Parties to armed conflict must protect civilians, and civilian objects take constant care to spare them from any attack. We have discussed this in almost every other conflict in this chamber around the world. This one is no different. International law affords specific protection to medical personnel and facilities to ensure the wounded and sick receive the medical care they need. It was no coincidence that one of the first humanitarian leaders on the scene after those events of the 7th of October was our dear friend and leader, Dr. Tedros of WHO. It's imperative that the wounded and sick receive the medical care they need. It is imperative that the parties respect their obligations under, the inter under international humanitarian law. And it is our collective responsibility. We are all involved in this. We are not observers. We are all involved in using all our influence to ensure that this is the case. This tragedy is characteristic of the crushing impact this conflict has had on civilians and as Tor has been pointing out, and Lana earlier, the catastrophic consequences it will have if it continues to escalate, as we fear. In just 11 days since that storming of Israel by Palestinian armed groups on 7th of October, the death toll, as has been mentioned, has already exceeded that of the 2014 hostilities which lasted more than seven weeks. The pace of death, of suffering, of destruction, of breaches of international law cannot be exaggerated. In Gaza, more than 3,000 people have been killed, more than 12,500 injured. Hundreds are unaccounted for under the rubble. And quite frankly, we do not know how many have moved from the north to the south to get out of harm's way. The death toll also, we all know this well, includes humanitarians. I want to pay tribute to the 15 UNRWA staff and Red Cross and Red Crescent personnel that I've been meeting these days, the families of those who have fallen. We estimate that maybe up to a million people have fled their homes to other parts of Gaza, but we don't really know. Uh, many have done so in response, indeed, to Israel's announcement that civilians should leave northern Gaza for safety. But there is simply nowhere to go for civilians to escape the destruction and privation, both of which grow by the hour as missiles continue to fly and essential supplies, including fuel, food, medical items, water, run low. Due to the scarcity of water, UNRWA in some locations, and I want to pay a special tribute to UNRWA for the way in which it's provided a buffer against suffering in these terrible times. And in UNRWA in some locations, is being forced to ration down to providing one liter of water per person per day. 
bear in mind that the minimum by international standards should be 15 meters. And they're getting one. And they're the lucky ones. People have been increasingly forced to consume from unsafe sources. We're hearing many, many more reports of that through UNRWA and other agencies, placing the population at risk, of course, of the outbreak of waterborne diseases. And whether civilians move or stay, and that must be their decision, whether to move or stay, whether to move again or stay where they have moved to. Whether they move or stay, they must be protected. They must not be attacked in places of civilian infrastructures. They must be protected in places of deconfliction. And they must have access to the essentials of humanitarian assistance to survive, which are available and in which we have all spent many, many detailed hours in detailed negotiations with the parties. And I'm grateful to them, to all of them, for the commitment that they have shown to these negotiations. It means that the UN and the humanitarian partners, and I specifically refer to the great leadership shown, and I met their leaders today, of the Egyptian Red Crescent and the Palestinian Red Crescent, must be able to relieve, deliver, deliver, excuse me, to deliver relief to civilians in need throughout Gaza without impediment in places of their choice, in places where they consider them safe, themselves to be safe and where we can seek to ensure that safety. We have humanitarian supplies. We have medical teams. UNRWA has a staff of 14,000 in Gaza still bravely working under these conditions. The other agencies do. The Red Crescents, of course, have many, many, many volunteers, and they are all ready to assist the people most in need. I'm very grateful to many member states for providing very quickly emergency funding for, available for the immediate relief in Gaza, including from the Central Emergency Response Fund that my office runs and the Occupied Territories Humanitarian Fund. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who stepped up so quickly. What we don't have, however, we have a lot, but what we don't have, and it's the killer, and what we desperately need is immediate safe humanitarian access across all of Gaza. And that is the burden of our discussions with key parties. We urgently need a mechanism agreed by all relevant parties to allow for the regular provision of emergency needs throughout Gaza, to get the level of distribution of assistance up to what it was before these terrible weeks of 100 trucks a day providing assistance throughout Gaza to people in need. We need to get back to that level of ambition. For that, we need additional funding for agencies like UNRWA, World Food Programme, and of course, for the Red Crescents uh, in their leadership role. And without new funding, UNRWA already painfully, woefully lacking in funds will not have the ability to continue to deliver core services. But as Mr. President, as Tor said, and I'm glad he did, and he made two, I think, very important points. Gaza is not the only location of concern in this deeply troubling conflict. Since the start of the latest hostilities, the situation in the West Bank has also been deteriorating, as Tor said, and he should know. Last week was the deadliest week for Palestinians in the West Bank since the United Nations started recording fatalities in 2005. While settler violence incidents also have gone up from an average of three incidents a day to eight, suffering knows no borders. Widespread closures throughout the West Bank are impacting the ability of communities to access essential services. 
and there is a real risk of the situation spiraling out of control. What the people of Israel, Palestine, the region need, what we all need, what this council's mandate is in existence to secure, is the sanity and humanitarian to prevail, drawing on the provisions of international humanitarian law for urgent efforts, this was towards the second point, to arrest any further dissent in this brutal calamity. Lana said it very eloquently, the worry that I suppose many of us have, where will this lead us? Where will this lead us when the fighting has taken place? Of course, we implore the parties to respect international humanitarian law. And by the way, I want to be very clear, a humanitarian ceasefire would go a long way to easing the epic human suffering. Finally, Mr. President, I know I've gone on too long. I want to conclude by expressing my deepest admiration, gratitude, and comity for the extraordinary people who are delivering life-saving and humanitarian services. Well, you've been listening there to the UN aid chief, Martin Griffiths, briefing the UN Security Council via video link, emphasizing the urgency of addressing the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Let's bring in Tariq Bakoni. He's the president of Al Shabaka, an independent Palestinian think tank, and also the author of the book, Hamas Contained. He joins me now live from New York. Tariq, Israel says that its bombardment of Gaza is in retaliation for Hamas's attacks, that it's striking Hamas military targets. What do you make of what they've hit so far? Well, what we've seen is really a continuation of Israeli uh, tactics that it's used in past military assaults on the Gaza Strip, which includes targeting civilian areas and targeting ambulances as well as healthcare centers. I think it's very clear for everyone who's looking at this that this isn't about retaliation against Hamas. What's in place now is a much broader program that's focused on ethnic cleansing. We saw in the first few days of the assault that began uh, about five days ago now, uh, there was discussion about a security corridor or humanitarian corridor that would allow Palestinians to get out of the Gaza Strip into Egypt. Palestinians understand what that corridor means. This isn't about humanitarianism. This is about ethnic cleansing and the depopulation of the Gaza Strip. And so rightly, a lot of Palestinians are worried about mass displacement, which has already affected uh, more than a million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. We are and what also, we're witnessing is... Tariq, hearing those concerns from the Egyptian and Jordanian governments as well. I just want to pick up on, on a word you use there, cleansing. Israel has said that it won't stop until Hamas is completely removed. And Hamas is not only an armed group, right? It's also regarded by many as a social movement of sorts. Can you remove Hamas from the Gaza Strip? Well, I think that's exactly the question that we need to be asking. I think the idea that Hamas can be destroyed or removed is nonsensical. Not only is the movement as you say, not only a military organization, but also a movement that provides social services, healthcare, education, uh, charitable work to Palestinians in Gaza and beyond Gaza. But it's also an ideology. Hamas's ideology is one that's committed to resistance to liberate Palestine. So this idea that uh, Israel is an apartheid regime and employs colonial violence against Palestinians and that it can continue to do that with impunity is one that Hamas's political project and military military project opposes. And if Hamas in, in uh, this imaginary world where Hamas is uh, decimated and destroyed, that ideology of Palestinian liberation, of pushing back against Israeli apartheid, will continue in a different guise. So this idea that they're trying to uh, kill Hamas is really a way of saying we don't want to deal with Palestinians. We want to decimate the Palestinian political project and forego any need to deal with the Palestinian political demands which are rights under inalienable uh, are, are inalienable rights under international law, including the right of return. Uh, well, Israel has not been drawing a distinction between the Palestinian residents of Gaza and Hamas. How much popular support does Hamas have now, Tariq? And, and what is its relationship like with the Palestinian leadership at this stage? 
Well, I think it's important to remember that Hamas was a party that was politically, uh, uh, democratically elected in 2006. So there is obviously a lot of support for Hamas's political project among Palestinians. Some of that support comes from a place of ideology. So Palestinians identify with Hamas's ideological platform. But Hamas also gets a lot of support from Palestinians for its military project. Uh, as a military power, Hamas is able to deter Israeli aggression and be the front line of defense for Palestinians who are otherwise defenseless, defenseless when they're facing colonial violence. And so Hamas in this way is seen to be a, an important uh, deterrent uh, uh, for, for Palestinians and one that can, can protect Palestinian civilians. Now, obviously, this is the Palestinian uh, Liberation Project is much bigger than Hamas. So Hamas doesn't speak on behalf of all Palestinians, but it is certainly a credible power. Now, the Palestinian Authority, as one of your correspondents was saying before, has its own baggage in the, in the West Bank. It's engaged in security coordination tactics. And at a time of war, when Palestinians are being bombarded ceaselessly in the Gaza Strip, it's coming out mm -hmm. to prevent protests in the West Bank in support of Palestinians. So mm -hmm. that is something that is seen as illegitimate and many Palestinians oppose. And we've seen a lot of, of anger and a lot of heightened tensions as a result of that. Tariq Bakoni there, the president of al Shabaka, an independent Palestinian think tank, and the author of the book, Hamas Contained. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts on Al Jazeera, Tariq. Thank you.